How old do you have to be? How old do you have to be before trouble in the world and in your life no longer causes you worry and concern? You know, there are folks around, adults even, who cannot answer that question because they are not there yet. They are concerned, and they do worry, sometimes excessively. But what about the young person who worries herself sick, sensitive to every single bit of information that she sees on TV and everywhere else that concerns her? How do we help that youngster? Hello, I'm Dr. James Sutton, and I'm a psychologist that works with issues and treatment of young people experiencing emotional and behavioral difficulties. I've done a lot of training on this topic and have written a number of books. Indeed, there are young people who cannot even watch the news without becoming quite upset. I believe this is partly due to the fact that it seems like there's always something going on somewhere. Things that affect the lives of our children and cause them concern and worry. Things like earthquakes, things like floods, tornadoes, fires, hurricanes, reactors gone crazy, senseless shootings and violence, and of course a bit closer to home, loved ones that die. The impact of these events and circumstances affect our children in another way also. You see, young people intuitively depend on the adults in their world to fix the problems for them. They expect us to. Susie expects the hospital and the doctors are going to fix Grandpa up so he can come home and be with her. Susie does not expect Grandpa to die. When our parents and our grandparents were young, they worried that the Japanese would attack the West Coast in, during World War II. In fact, it was thought that an attack could reach as far as Chicago. Then, after the Korean conflict, we focused on a new problem. The Russians and the atomic bomb and all the concerns that came with that. I can still remember the A-bomb drills in elementary school. Can anyone still remember the slogan when you see the flash duck and cover? Folks when you see the flash it's over. <laughs> I can remember businesses on the outskirts of town that sold family fallout shelters. You purchased these things and you buried them in your backyard. Here's one right here. That's really cozy, isn't it? My family did not have a fallout shelter, but we did have a storm cellar, and it worked about the same. Take a look at this thing. How would you like to spend several weeks in something like that? Sometimes it does seem that there's enough trouble and threat to go around certainly enough to create fear and concern in just about anyone. We cannot shelter and shield our children from every single shred of news that we encounter or that they hear or see, nor should we. But we can offer them clarification and support. And here are seven suggestions for doing that. Number one, very important, always remember Young people personalize everything. That's just the way they are. When a youngster expresses concern and empathy for other children who've been troubled by the things we talked about earlier, the earthquakes, floods, tornadoes, all of that, there's a very significant, deeper message. And here it is. What if that happened to me? I believe their thoughts and their empathy and their concerns are genuine and real, but their most troubled thoughts really are closer to home. Number two, don't minimize their worries or their feelings. We shouldn't say things like, no, you shouldn't worry about that, or 
that's not something you should worry about, or why would you worry about that? Because that only causes them now to be or feel foolish for experiencing fear, which is a valid emotion. It's better to say something like, you know, I understand your concerns. How can I help you? And that can make a difference. Number three, clarify the facts. Now here's where we can help a lot because when kids don't have good facts, they make up their own. And generally, the stuff they make up is usually much worse than the truth. A child growing up in Kansas, for instance, might have right to worry about tornadoes, but she can be shown how a tsunami or a hurricane probably isn't likely at all in Kansas. That does at least limit things just a little bit. Offer soothing and support through family rituals. Hug them more often. Touch them. Be with them. Talk to them. Keep that dialogue open with your children. I can still remember very warmly my parents or my grandmother sitting with me as I said my bedtime prayers. Those were special times. They made a difference in my life, and they still make a difference in my life. Number five, suggest how they might help. Doing something not only helps others, but it offers a sense of some sort of control over the circumstances and situations at hand. For instance, a child could be encouraged to collect aluminum cans or get together some friends to collect them with the proceeds going to Red Cross assistance somewhere. They're involved. They're helping. And they should know that. I remember back in the days of the A-bomb scare, my father was a civil defense block warden. He went to all the meetings, collected all the material, clipped information out of the paper and made scrapbooks and attended first aid classes and stayed prepared just in case. I cannot tell you how many pretend broken heads and arms and broken legs my sister and I sustained for the cause of civil defense. But the bottom line was, Dad felt better when he could do something. And it's the same for us and the same for our children. Number six, remain observant. Note any changes in eating or sleeping habits, for instance. Look for any excessive signs of stress or anxiety that are unusual for that child. Also note if they are seeing to have difficulty just handling everyday frustrations. In other words, less, less tolerance for frustrations. And very important, monitor their progress and their grades and school because school is a very good barometer of what's going on with any child since all kids are supposed to go to school. And the last one, number seven, seek assistance if needed. Although a child's parents certainly should be a first line resource, sometimes mom and dad feel overwhelmed by the task and input from a school counselor or a family's minister could prove helpful. That's the seven. And these came from an article that was published in my monthly publication, the ODD Management Digest. Now, this comes out monthly. It's a resource for parents and child service professionals. And it addresses every month emotional behavioral issues in young people, especially kids, children, and teens who have what we would call oppositional and defiant or difficult behavior because there may be some reasons into that. I certainly would encourage you to uh, subscribe to it and there's no cost. It's a free subscription. Just go to my website, look on the right side and you'll see it there and you can click on that and, and have that resource and I hope you do.